All right, welcome to the uh, continuation of week eight. We're going to continue our look at the 18th Amendment in chapter 15. Uh, in addition to the sentencing and uh, cruel and unusual um, cases we looked in chapter 14, we're going to look at conditions in prison. Uh, historically, the courts took kind of a hands-off approach. There aren't any constitutional guidelines in this area. However, that, that viewpoint has changed. Uh, we can say that the gates were open starting back in 67 with the Wright case. An inmate in a state prison filed suit without assistance of counsel under Section 1983 claiming that prison conditions in solitary confinement were deplorable. And your text goes into some detail about that a case. And here's just a few of the claims. The appeals court in Wright gave a brief overview of the history of the Eighth Amendment, referencing the uh, Supreme Court's holding in Weems. Uh, it's, quote, the Constitution may acquire meaning as public opinion becomes enlightened by humane justice. And the concept of cruel and unusual is found in an ever-changing state of public opinion and the views of an American society. In Wright, the appeals court said the alleged condition, if established, would be cruel and unusual. The appeals court and Wright returned the case to the trial court for a hearing on the truthfulness of the charges. If proved, Wright would be entitled to relief under Section 1983, and a judge concurring in the holding warned that this would open the courts to a flood of complaints under Section 1983, which it did. Uh, we also look at crowding in prisons and jails. Uh, many prisons are crowded beyond their desirable capacity. Such crowding can lead to a lot of conditions, overcrowding, um, is seen as inappropriate as making a judgment on what level of prison population is bad. Prison and jails can be effectively run at a population above capacity if there's adequate funding and resources. And um, those are the two factors the court usually considers. Uh, a better way to describe it would be um, a population that's reached a tr unless it's truly unmanageable that it's crowding. Crowding in prisons has uh, led to many lawsuits, most under 1983. Many suits have led to court orders or consent decrees requiring corrective action, and at least 40 states have been under sun, such orders or decrees. Consent decrees are agreements by the parties and approved by the court that certain actions will occur to improve conditions. And some defendant administrators have signed such agreements because they agreed with the provisions and wanted to see the change. Um, but the consent decrees have significant drawbacks. The duration of the consent decree can be an issue, uh, especially for the next administrator, a requirement for adherence, regardless of subsequent occurrences, and failure to adhere could place prison officials in contempt. And it raises an interesting question. What right does an administrator have to sign an agreement that requires the government to spend large sums of taxpayer money for programs? Some court decisions involving conditions of prison or jails led to court-appointed masters to assist the court in the administration of granted relief. If a court's going to grant some type of remedy like this, then they're going to have to monitor it. And then um, the Prison Litigation Reform Act, some of the effects, um, while it does doesn't change the inmate's substantive rights, it does establish guidelines such as requiring exhaustion, exhaustion of remedies, uh, the PLRA reflects congressional intent to delimit judicial management of prisons. It went into detail about consent decrees, uh, prescriptive relief, On existing consent decrees, the PLRA provides for termination of the decree upon motion of any party or intervener no later than two years after the date the court granted or approved the prospective release, one year after the court has entered an order denying termination, or for orders issued prior to the PLRA's enactment two years from the date. Look at uh, a few cases, the Bell versus Wolfish case, which we mentioned before in 79. It's the first Supreme Court case dealing with conditions of confinement and interpreting the Eighth Amendment. So the Eighth Amendment was also a focus in the case. Uh, the MCC in New York had a plan capacity 449, primarily single occupancy rooms, and increased the confinement numbers to that led to double bunking. The issue is it constitutionally 
valid or is it a violation of the Constitution to overcrowd? And that is to place two or more uh, inmates in a space that's designed for one. Uh, because the inmates were pretrial detainees, inmates could not be punished at all. The issue was one of due process. Under the due process clause, the detainee may not be punished prior to an adjudication of guilt. And a court focuses a look at whether the conditions or restrictions of that pretrial detention amounted to punishment of the detainees. The court held that if a particular condition or restriction of pretrial detention is reasonably related to a legitimate government objective, it does not, without more, amount to punishment. But if the restriction or, or condition is arbitrary or purposeless, a court could permissibly interfere, infer that the purpose of that action is punishment. So the court in the Wolfish case um, held as a matter of law that double bunking as done as the MCC did not amount to punishment and did not inviolate uh, or violate due process rights. And the court held that the government must be able to take steps to maintain institution security and order. The Wolfish uh, ruling is important on two points. It provides a standard and it ruled that double bunking isn't per se unconstitutional. So the Wolfish decision has allowed jails to double bunk and otherwise crowd so long as the conditions don't become a gen genuine privation and hardship over an extended uh, period of time. In Rhodes, the issue is whether the housing of two mates in a single cell at the Southern Ohio Correctional Facility is cruel and unusual, prohibited by 8th and 14th Amendment. The inmates brought a Section 1983 action claiming that the double selling resulted in inmates living too closely and crowding strain the facility and staff. The court noted the conditions could not involve the wanton and an unnecessary infliction of pain, nor be grossly disproportionate. This is the current uh, standard of decency to measure whether conditions amount to cruel and unusual punishment. The court, uh, using the standard, found no cruel and unusual punishment in double bunking per se or on the conditions that prevailed at the prison, saying the Constitution does not mandate comfortable prisons. There's the Whitley case from 86. It focused more on the, the use of force. And here are some of the facts. Uh, the inmate Albers filed a 1983 action alleging an Eighth Amendment deprivation because of the physical damage to his knee, plus mental and emotional distress. Um, is the holding of the court, and the court, uh, as a result, in this case, held that there was no Eighth Amendment violation. In the Tennessee v. Gardner case, the case involved the shooting of a fleeing suspect by a police officer, and the court used this uh, three standards or three standards to meet. The use of force test. And so um, taking this analysis and applying it to use of force in prison or jail, uh, the first element is seen as implicit in using force to stop an escapee or would be escapee. Uh, in a prison disturbance or an escape, elements two and three should also be followed. In a prison that houses convicted felons or those accused of violent crimes, the second element appears to be met to require staff in a prison or jail to identify a person scaling a wall or fleeing from the prison before shots can be fired ordinarily would not be reasonable. In the Wilson case in 91, this case involved the conditions of confinement. An inmate in Ohio facility raised the 1983 action, alleged things like overcrowding, excessive noise, heat and cooling issue, um, and the Supreme Court qualified the guidance uh, in Whitley as applying to circumstances which officials were reacting to an emergency situation. Uh, in the Wilson case, the case remanded to, was remanded to lower courts to determine whether any of the conditions violated a deliberate indifference standard. In Hudson, the case looked at what degree of injury is required before an inmate can claim an Eighth Amendment cruel and unusual violation. A Louisiana inmate claimed he was beaten by guards while he was handcuffed and shackled. The appeals court held that this must be there must be a significant injury, and the Supreme Court reversed, holding the core judicial inquiry as that set forth in Whitley. And was a force implied in a good faith effort to maintain or restore discipline or maliciously uh, to cause harm. In Smith, the appeals court looked at whether a prison officer could be held liable if he had a reasonable opportunity to intervene but refused to. 
uh, there was a 1983 action in this case too. The federal appeals court said Officer Palakinas could be held liable, provided he had a reasonable opportunity to intervene and simply did not. Quote, the approving silence emanated from the officer who stands by and watches contribute to the actual use of excessive force. The appeals court acknowledged that there could be a greater degree of dereliction of duty for a supervisor than for an officer of lower rank. Uh, in the farmer case, the farm, farmer was a biological male who was medically diagnosed as transsexual, housed at a federal pen, inmate usually segregated from the general prison population, released in the general population, and in a couple of weeks he was beaten and raped. Farmer filed a Bivens suit, which is equivalent of a federal 1983 action, claimed he was subject to cruel and unusual punishment. The lower courts granted the prison officials summary judgment, and the Supreme Court, in remanding the case, stated the prison officials had a duty to protect inmates from violence at the hands of inmates. In the Helling v. McKinney case, there's another 1983 uh, case around um, environmental tobacco smoke and how this... Um, create an unreasonable risk to health and that that was a violation of the Eighth Amendment. Uh, uh, the court restated its ruling in other cases that prison officials may not be deliberately indifferent and the court remanded the case. Uh, Farmer filed a Bivens suit, uh, claimed he had been subject to cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, the Supreme Court in remanding the case stated that prison officials have a duty to protect inmates from violence at the hands of other inmates. And some other cases around um, treatment. This is another case, Riley, is another case involving uh, ETS. And you can see in these cases the, the, uh, the standard of deliberate indifference. And in this case, the appellate court held for the inmate. Let's talk a little bit about immunity. Um, focus uh, in immunity in 1983 cases where the officials may be personally sued because of claim violation of the constitutional rights of others. Uh, in, if it's called absolute immunity, that means a person can't be sued because the actions are protected. Uh, qualified immunity may be available. It works when inmates needs to show a violation of a constitutional right. And if this can be shown, it must further be shown the right was clearly established at the time the action was complained about. In Hope, an Alabama inmate was handcuffed to a hitching post in prison due to his disruptive conduct. He filed a 1983 action, and the Supreme Court held that this was an Eighth Amendment violation.